Hey everybody, this week's episode deals with some pretty adult subject matter, so even though you're going to hear us make fun of the quiet quite a bit in this episode, we also wanted to acknowledge the fact that sexual abuse and child rape is not at all a laughing matter, so you'll see in the show notes that there's a link to resources, and we just wanted to promote that if you or anyone that you know finds themselves in a situation where they are being harmed by an adult and specifically their parent, there are resources available such as Child Help Nation. So please don't feel like you need to stay quiet. Make sure that you reach out if you need help. This is the Bloody Disgusting Podcast Network. back to horror queers we're talking the atrocious treatment of deaf people we're talking beethoven and we're talking connor kennedy wants to fuck me and i'm joe and i'm trace and we're talking connor kennedy came four times today oh my god this kid is a sexual (laughs) deviant (laughs) he's um he's an element of this of this film's many elements um that (laughs) Just keeps on adding and not doing anything with. But uh, yeah, we're talking Jamie Babbitt's The Quiet, y'all. Well, we certainly are. And <laughs> I can unequivocally say that this is a movie that exists. You stole my line. Uh, actually, I, <laughs> again, I know I was not surprised to go to Letterboxd and see your half star rating for this film last night. This is a film that uh, I'm not going to be able to defend it. I'm not going to be able to like confidently say this is why this is good and this is why this is good but for some reason i like this movie kind of (laughs) Uh, i mean as eric siska always says on we hate movies it's okay to like a movie and in my own defense after ruminating on it for 24 hours i have bumped it up a little bit to a star generous (laughs) two. what (laughs) i you know what i decided that alicia cuthbert's performance is worthy of a star and i like some of the cinematography and lighting and that was worth a star oh that blue lighting i'm not prepared to give anything more to this film you know what two stars is really generous i'm for you i mean like i'm actually surprised but but i don't want to get too much into it because i know we have two other people on the line who probably also have a lot of things to say so Ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between, you know them as the co-hosts of the super amazing and wonderfully hilarious podcast, Kill by Kill, which picks apart your favorite horror franchises frame by frame, er, kill by kill. You may have even heard us on their second Nightmare on Elm Street 2 episode and their second Freddy vs. Jason episode. We come in second a lot, Joe. Not gonna lie. (laughs) Uh, I'm good with sloppy seconds. (laughs) Please welcome Patrick Hamilton and Gina Radcliffe. Greetings and salutations, everyone. Thank you for having us. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just shocked because I thought Connor Kennedy wanted to fuck me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tell me he wants to fuck me, Gina. Tell me he wants to fuck me. <laughs> Gina, he asked very nicely if you could tell him that Connor wants to fuck him. Can you do that for him? Stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about him. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Fine. Yes. Connor Kennedy definitely wants to fuck you. <laughs> Welcome, guys. It's been a long time. <laughs> it has, and and we're here talking about this. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we should apologize because <laughs> no, we had planned to bring you on for like, we were like, what is the dumbest, most campy, <laughs> stupid movie that we can think of? And then Trace keeps talking up the quiet like, oh, it's this dirty incest movie with Alicia Cuthbert. And I thought, yes, this is perfect for the kill by kill folks. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> In my defense, in my defense, this is a movie that I have seen at least six or seven times because it didn't get a wide release back in 06, but it was, it's for some reason showed at the AMC theaters that I was working at at the time because I would have been like 17 when it came out. Yeah, because it was filmed around the corner from your house. Well, no, no, no. I I grew up in Houston. This was filmed in Austin, but... It's (laughs) It's a slightly different level of humidity, Joe. But it's one of those where I was, you know, I saw the trailer and, you know, it's like Sony Pictures Classics because this is a classic film, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But 
stamp of quality. I think 17-year-old Trace was like, oh, it's like watching Crouching Tiger, because that was also Sony Pictures class. So I'm like, oh my I'm god. Getting, oh I, my god. I'm getting cultured by watching this movie, and so I go to see this in theaters after even knowing the reviews are bad, and we'll get to those in a minute. And I don't know. I just, it felt so dirty, like, for me to watch this movie, and so I just showed it to a lot of people in college. <laughs> I mean, I'm way older than 17, and this still made me feel really dirty. <laughs> oh, this is not this is not a feel good movie. No. no, but it's also not nearly as dirty no. as I feel it wants to be. It's very much you know, okay, we're going to have these people saying yeah a lot of naughty things, but yes. they're not actually doing anything except one extremely clumsy sex scene. <laughs> oh <Yeah. my> God. <laughs> With Camilla Bell acting as I would expect Camilla Bell acts in real life, which is lifeless. Oh, she's an actress and she's known for the things she does on a mattress. <laughs> I'm so glad you listened to the song. <laughs> oh, yeah, I tuned right in. Uh, everyone, in case you don't know what that's a reference to, um, Taylor Swift wrote a song, oh, I think it was in the late 2000s, called Better Than Revenge that is specifically about Camilla Bell that does feature the prize lyric, She's not a saint and she's not what you think. She's an actress. She's better known for the things that she does on the mattress. <laughs> and let's be yeah. honest, the most notable thing about Camilla Bell is that lyric. It is! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it makes her sound way cooler than I've ever seen her appear. So it's got that going for it. I think she's somebody that I, I kind of knew vaguely existed, but this might have been the first thing I ever watched her in. And She's not good. She no. is not good. Oh, no. Gina, let us tell you, this is the best she's ever been. Yeah, it wow. is. It is. So I, I always tell people it's her best role because she barely speaks. And even, but even her voiceovers are like really, oh my really God. bad. Those oh. voiceovers. Is she on the Vicodin that they claim the other characters are on? Because that's what it sounds like. <laughs> hey, y'all, I showed up on set with my own set of Vicodin. <laughs> This is how I'm going to perform. I don't know why she's Southern. We're going with it. Gina, so I'm assuming you have not seen the When a Stranger Calls remake. No. Okay. Oh, God. Oh, so God. It, don't, don't watch it. It's not good. But I would recommend you go watch the trailer because there is a line delivery of that where she's like, stop calling me. <laughs> <laughs> Delivered just like that. <laughs> Yeah, watch it for that, and watch it for the house porn, which is like the most gorgeous house you'll ever see. Oh, it's screen. a good looking house. It is. I don't know if there was a real house or a, a one, you know, a one set <laughs> horror movie sort of sitch, mm -hmm. but it's a very good looking house, and she has a wonderful set of eyebrows. <laughs> and there you go. And therein lies the good qualities of Camilla Bell. Yes. At one time, she got prime Joe Jonas. You know, <laughs> so she has that going for her. She has me beat there. Joe Jonas wants to fuck me. Joe Jonas wants to fuck me. <laughs> tell me Joe Jonas wants to fuck me. Tell me, tell me, tell me. <laughs> but I'm secretly a lesbian. If you hadn't told me this was 2006, I would have never guessed it. Because it just has that very early 90s Poison Ivy thing to it. Oh, yeah. Where everything is super shadowy mm -hmm. and like... Everybody, the actors playing high schoolers are way too old to be playing high schoolers. Um, we will oh get God. to Miss Katie, Katie Nixon, Nixon in a bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. What is this 40-year-old woman doing in my teenage film? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, I have written for Katie Mixon. She's a very nice person, and she's very funny, and she's terrible in this movie. No, But no. she joins everyone else in the movie at being terrible in Patrick, this movie. I love Katie Mixon, and it's so funny because I, I watch American Housewife. Like, I think she, I think it's a really funny show. But I remember when she popped up in, like, Four Christmases, you know, a decade ago. Mm-hmm. And this whole time, I'm like, why do I know Katie Mixon? Why do I know Katie Mixon? And I just yeah. thought it was from Four Christmases. And it does turn out that it was from this movie. <laughs> it's how I knew Katie Mixon. <laughs> the lasting cultural impact. We can't be hard on her because, because nobody comes away from this movie with their hands clean. No. Not a single person. I felt so bad for Edie Falco in this movie. Oh my god, what did they pay her? Uh, just, like, she's in, in a movie of also rands. And some of them have also ran farther than others. It's a very <laughs> also ran movie. And then you have her, who at this moment in time could not have been hotter. Like, she could yeah. have greenlit anything she wanted to do. She's like, 
I got to go to Austin and be in this movie for half an hour and eventually get naked for no fucking reason. No reason. Ugh. Because the movie has decided I do not look pathetic enough. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing more pathetic, apparently, than a suburban middle class white lady on pills. So, like, <laughs> let's just have her doff her top and just fall onto the ground. Well, well, her jar of mayonnaise husband doesn't want to have sex with her anymore. So this is a <laughs> this is a failing on her part. <laughs> well, yes. We will talk about all the implications of that because, again, we've also got a mother who knows that her daughter and husband are having a sexual, incestuous relationship and does nothing. Trace, there's a wallpaper problem. You have to consider <laughs> the wallpaper problem. That's at least 60 to 70 percent of her day. <laughs> I just thought at one point, like, she, oh, wait, I mean, we should probably get to wait for the plot, but <laughs> like, my favorite part of the whole movie is that she just collapsed in the living room, or, or this empty room, and Martin Donovan, who plays her husband, goes, are you all right? She's like, she's like, decorating is hard. <laughs> just like, like, you know what? You're right, Edie Falco, decorating is hard. I don't know. I was a particular fan of, I'm going to sleep right here on the floor, and then she just gets down. I mean, she is a 2020 mood board in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> just strip down your undies, just lay down on the floor. Oh, That sounds ideal. For all of our listeners, if you haven't seen this film, oh um, it is God. run right out. <laughs> it is streaming on Amazon Prime. <laughs> I think it's also on Tubi, is it not? Of course it's on Tubi. Uh, maybe. Of it's on Tubi. <laughs> it is 100% on Amazon Prime, though, so and you don't have to pay for it, at least as of this recording. So, you know. It pays for itself, really. It does. <laughs> it, and, and you may be wondering, Trace and Joe, why are you covering this film? It's, um, it's not really know. a horror movie. And I will have you know that in the film's Wikipedia, there is a whole section devoted to genre where apparently someone from Salon said that it wobbles between genres. And then, in a book... <laughs> it definitely wobbles. I'll give it that. <laughs> in a book called 21st Century Horror Films from 2017, someone said it's a horror film, saying that Dot represents the gothic heroine haunted by her past, while Nina embodies the girl in a horror movie whose fear of a monster invading her bedroom comes true. <laughs> Oh my god, fart noise. <laughs> I'm sorry, and people accuse us of reaching? Jamie Babbitt apparently did, um, she was drawn to the screenplay because it exemplified the suburban horror genre. And I think they were going sure. for like a horror version of American Beauty. Yeah, people reference American Beauty in this a lot. And honestly, Gina, when you were saying, oh, this feels like it came out in a Poison Ivy era, it really gives off that, that late 90s vibe, right? Like I could have seen this being green lit after somebody saw American Beauty and said, how do we make a $900,000 version of that? Exactly. And you, know, you got the, you got all the earmarks. You've got, you know, quote unquote, teenagers mm -hmm. who, who don't talk like teenagers at all. Well, the, the, the people in this movie don't talk like people. Well, that's no. true. That, that's no. fair. <laughs> Let, let's not limit it to the teenage characters. <laughs> that's, very, that's very true. Now, there's lots of blame to spread around here. Well, and, and that's kind of what I think is so fascinating about this film, because I feel like everyone involved thought they were making high art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so the reason that this film came about, so basically it's all thanks to Alicia Cuthbert. <laughs> she had done The Girl Next Door, and she had just finished filming House of Wax, and she was like, you know what? I don't want to be the hot girl in the movie anymore. Like, I want to be like a character with things to do. And she decided this was the avenue to that. Yes, she needed to fire her management. This script, written by uh, co-written by Abdi Nazimian and Micah Schraft. Now, Abdi is gay, and after watching the special features on the DVD, I can confidently say that Micah's also gay. <laughs> but basically, they, they their script came from a Sundance workshop, uh -huh. and Cuthbert read the script. I guess she, it's almost like the blacklist, but it's like, hey, here's a bunch of like up and coming indie people doing scripts in this workshop. Take a look. And she picked this one. Wow. So we can blame Sundance for this. Is what it's you're interesting. Saying. This is definitely written by people who think that heterosexual sex is repulsive. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and which, you know. It kind of is. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but like the, the, the focus on how like this character Connor goes on and on about he's constantly jerking off and you know, the, the, the sex scene they do have is, is you know, just oh. very unpleasant. Yeah. And, and I would categorize this as, you know, just barely an erotic thriller. 
<laughs> yeah, there's no sexy in here at all. Right, there's no eroticism. You've got people talking about sex. Yeah. In a sort of vulgar way. Like, like in a way that doesn't even really sound enticing. It's just like, you do, I'm sorry, you do what with his nipples? What? You know? <laughs> It's honestly, like, in terms of the crew, like, probably one of the queerest films we've discussed in the podcast, because director Jamie Babbitt is a lesbian, and her probably most most well-known film is the lesbian comedy camp classic, But I'm a Cheerleader. Mm -hmm. Which is an excellent film. It could not be more diametrically opposed to this film. Outside of her framing, you would not know it's the same director. But I think that's why she took it, though. I think because she, she had done something like that, I'm a cheerleader, which was so colorful and so bright and so funny and had a lot of heart and was like, I'm going to do the exact opposite. It definitely feels like she's trying to break out of the model that she put herself in with that first big film, right? Like, mm -hmm. don't pigeonhole me. I'm capable of doing, like, dark, dramatic dramas. And I'm going to tackle this really taboo subject. I've got this hot star. This movie's going to make bank. Well, it was supposed to. But at least I think it was supposed to make waves because it did premiere at TIFF. In reference to the subject matter, I do want to point out that everyone, yeah, this film deals with some very serious subject matter. There will be a lot of making fun of this film, and I don't want anyone to think that we're making or taking the subject matter lightly. It's only that the film doesn't really handle the subject matter very well, which makes it borderline comical. Right, and they're, they're trying to if they're trying to be titillating about it, which you you shouldn't do that when when you know your plot involves incest and child yeah. abuse. <laughs> right, yeah. it's one of those things where it does not go far enough. Like I would put, let's put this in a comparison mode here. Amityville to the beginning <laughs> also has an incest, you know, subplot to it. Okay, but it's so over the top and so operatic with how histronic things get that it becomes something you can have fun with and laugh at even though it is gross mm -hmm. right here it doesn't know which lane it kind of wants to be in it wants to titillate you and it wants to say something and it lands in the middle and it's like i want to say something gross what for 90 fucking minutes okay I, I think that Babbitt was trying to do art house, but too much of her aesthetic from But I'm a Cheerleader, or at least her, her directing sensibility was creeping in. And she's moved to a lot of TV, and I think that the TV medium has been like well-suited for her. Unfortunately, mm. she hasn't really matched the film success of But I'm a Cheerleader since it came out in, what, 1999? Yeah. Yeah. Well, th this, this would not be her best calling card. No. Whereas But I'm a Cheerleader floats on two great central performances and it's ebullient and it feels naughty and fun and it really pushes a, a lot of uh, different buttons in a fun interesting way and unfortunately this just thinks that pushing buttons is enough yeah so let, let's discuss then about how this film i mean obviously we know it, alicia cuthbert like kind of kickstarted it before kickstarter was a thing the thing is this, and this is what I think is weird. Now, I went to UT film school, like, so I'm familiar with its kind of, like, its skeleton. Mm -hmm. This film was produced by UT's Burnt Orange Productions, and so no less than about 36 university students worked on this film. And when you look at the special features on the DVD, you can tell that it was made by the UT student staff. <laughs> right. I don't think it exists anymore. Um, I don't know if this was their only production, or if they did more, they gifted the world with more cinematic... <clears throat> masterpieces after this <laughs> the quiet sank this studio <laughs> well okay so first of all thora birch was supposed to be dot she drops out about two to three weeks before production and alicia cuthbert was like well i wanted to be dot from the get-go let me be dot and babbitt is like look dot's supposed to be invisible you're not invisible you are the hot girl <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so even though uh, Cuthbert is a producer, she's an associate producer on this film, she still gets stuck with the girl of Nina. Although I would argue that Nina's the much more interesting character to play in this film. Oh, oh yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. But if you're Alicia Cuthbert and you've kind of been playing variations on this character, I think Dot makes more sense from I'm trying to stretch my dramatic chops. Mm -hmm. But if you're Babbitt or if you're anybody who's looking at this film as a financial property, you're thinking we're not going to shut Alicia Cuthbert up for 90 minutes. Right. Except for Beethoven voiceovers. 
Yeah, and so, like, and they, they did a lot of work. Like, Cuthbert went and spoke to psychiatrists about sexual abuse. The cast read articles about women who had been sexually abused to, I guess, like, enlighten them some more. Mm-hmm. They film it September, October 2004, and it is one of the first films to use high-definition video to film it. They use HDP24, and that is the reason why the film is so blue, because they thought that that looked the best on HD film, yeah. right now on HD. Yeah, I mean, particularly in the scenes which they're having a conversation with the lunch lady, <laughs> it looks like the oh cafeteria God. from Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2. But yeah. It's just so overly shadowed. Like, you'd think a, yeah. the, a Batman villain was serving up uh, <laughs> shit on a shingle there. <laughs> Riddle me this, Alicia Cuthbert. <laughs> And what's so funny is that Alicia Cuthbert's like a really good comedian, and while I respect her trying to do something dramatic like this, it is it is just a bizarre choice. And I do wonder if, like me, she was like, there's a bunch of naughty things in this film, this will be perfect. Because she was 22 when this was filmed. It's definitely a teen actress trying to break into a more adult role, but every problem in this movie originates from the script. And like, I don't care how good an actress you are, you can't overcome the garbage in this script. Yes. And that is the thing. So basically, because of the budget, which was about, yeah, $900,000, like Joe said, they had to do a lot of changing during filming. Like, one of the featurettes on this DVD is literally the two writers being filmed by, I would presume, UT students, (laughs) rewriting something, like, day of in the cafeteria. Because the budget wouldn't allow them to, like, go shoot in the gym locker room or something. I'm surprised it was rewritten. Because so much... (laughs) Of the dialogue seems like a one pass attempt of like, I got to get something down on the page and then I'll go back and I'll massage it so that it sounds like a human being said it. And then it never (laughs) really got that second pass. They're like, good enough. (laughs) And also we're shooting 50 pages today, everybody. So hold on to your hats. (laughs) Well, one of my problems with the, with this script is, and and this is you know, always a, a a point of contention for me is every single character in this movie is terrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to kind of root for Dot because everybody yes. just treats her like she's some sort of like you know alien, even though one being being hearing impaired is not particularly unusual. But like nobody knows what to do with this girl. Like nobody knows how to communicate yeah. with her. They they like they're just like looking at her like a bug under a microscope and it's like, this can't be the person who <laughs> ever encountered somebody who couldn't hear. But everybody's just like, what do we do? It's like she's the biggest fucking bird. Yeah. Yeah. Like what do we do with her? We don't know what to do. How do we talk to this girl? And we'll probably talk about it as we get to maybe I guess the turning point maybe of the film, but like she's also an accomplice to child molestation because she sees it and doesn't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. Because she's basically almost running a long con on people for no reason. No. Cause it makes her feel closer to her dead father. Who's not been dead for a short period of time, but a rather long period of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it would not surprise you to know that this movie didn't make a lot of money in theaters. No. <laughs> it premiered what? at TIFF in 2005. <laughs> and I think that, the reviews out of that were so bad. I mean, I don't know why Sony... I don't know if Sony Pictures Classics already had it or if they picked it up after the fact, but nevertheless, this gets a release in August of 2006, so almost a year later, in seven theaters. And then the Oof. next week, it increases uh, to 366 theaters, and that is the widest it goes. Okay. We're looking at, at a worldwide... So firmly world... theatrical, or like limited theatrical. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. So we're looking at a domestic gross of $381,000. It doesn't go overseas, at least from what I can tell. Rotten Tomatoes, we're looking at a 22% with an average score of 3.95 out of 10. <laughs> I did pull a few blurbs of reviews, and I would like to dramatically read them to you. <laughs> Please do. The spotlight is on you, sir. Good grief. just that's it that's it that's all i can say pretentious and pointless yeah too bad to be good but not bad enough to be campy that is so yeah how can a movie structured around incest murder parental alcoholism underage fornication and overt flirting between same-sex cheerleaders be so bland frigid and hopelessly lifeless yeah good question Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be a thriller, but the only time we were thrilled was when it was over. Wow. This is one that I think would maybe touch on your Poison Ivy stuff, Gina. 
Yet more self-conscious schlock masquerading as a thoughtful effort, The Quiet thinks it out-heathers all the mean girls, but really just ends up whimpering in the dark. What? what? And finally... <laughs> I think there's a reference salad that you spilled all over this podcast. <laughs> that's, a, that's a critic thinking they were smart. Yeah. And finally we have... At this advanced level of sophistication, one starts to wonder if Abdi Nazemian and Micah Schraff's screenplay was written entirely in capital letters, or perhaps crayon. <laughs> Why not both, as the Tostitos <laughs> Chip Girl says. Yeah, the second draft is crayon. Well, I would counter that with this review from Movie Kingdom that I found via Google, which five people found helpful. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, <laughs> memorable, taught a lesson, period. I don't know how to explain its excellency, but it is beyond the awesomeness. Amazing. So, deep thought. My salute to the complete movie writer, cast, producer, director, everyone. Make movies like this again. 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 <laughs> it's part of the Make America Great Again initiative. <laughs> oh my it's god. Like this again. <laughs> Make movies the quiet again. <laughs> Again, that is a 2020 mood. <laughs> I'm really surprised I didn't see more puns on the word quiet in reviews, but I did not. Yeah, there were some weird things that came out in some of these reviews. I was perturbed by the number of critics who were unwilling to let Babbitt's interest in cheerleaders go unmentioned. Yeah, She's got a cheerleader in this movie, and the other one was literally called But I'm a Cheerleader. It started to feel a little bit anti-queer to me like what is this woman's fascination with teenage girls and like homoeroticism certainly no one else has ever touched that or put it into a high school movie so right you have to nail her on this because it's almost untouched anywhere else in cinema but if anyone's gonna do it right shouldn't it be a lesbian who might have had similar experiences exactly I mean, we, we've praised but I'm a tree leader, but that movie also got really bad reviews when it came out. Yeah, there's not going to be a, qu a quiet renaissance in a couple mm -hmm. years from now. <laughs> Listeners. A quiet revolution? Yeah. Make Listeners, movies the quiet again. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, what did you think of this movie? <laughs> yeah, that's our episode. That, that's as much as we're going to talk about it. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't really have much left to say except, yeah, I mean, this is an all-star cast. I mean, obviously, besides Cuthbert Bell, you got Martin Donovan, who I had really only known from Saved at the time, but he's great. Yeah. Falco, Sean Ashmore, who filmed this, I think, between X2 and X-Men 3. Oof. A pre-fame Shannon Woodward from uh, Raising Hope and Westworld. Yeah. And The Last of Us Part 2. Also, the kid that played Simon in Seventh Heaven in maybe two scenes of this movie? <laughs> sure. I don't know. Um, really contributes to that all star cast. Yeah, he really does. I mean, literally, I was watching this and I wrote my notes like, Simon, what happened to you? <laughs> I thought he like went to meth, but that was Aaron Carter, and they look very similar. <laughs> <Sure>. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> meth is not a joke. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Good. Can I begin? Yeah, you can. Okay. So after the first of a million uses of intrusive voiceover, <laughs> we're introduced to Dot, Camilla Bell. She is our deaf protagonist, and we know this because she reads the lips of her new sister, sister in quotation marks. But did y'all really like the editing when she's like, when I talk to someone, I'm a half of myself. And then when it's two people, I'm a third. But then like the frame of her face like starts cutting out like pizza wedges. Yes, uh, it's it, I, I didn't get it until I saw it <laughs> visually. <laughs> And then combined with her telling me what it is. I mean, that's what that's the the beauty of cinema. Is you can really both is, tell yeah. people and show people something. And when you put it together, it just makes the, you know, miasma of it all pop into <laughs> life. It's magic. I tell you. Oh, God. Cinema. <laughs> Editing. Screenwriting. So yeah, she is reading the lips of her new sister, Nina, played by Alicia Cuthbert, and joined by Nina is Michelle, Katie Mixon, and they are gossiping about how Connor, Sean Ashmore, must be a, quote, massive fuck. <laughs> but if you haven't seen the film, they're talking about this in a good way, like, he must have a big dick, and also he's great at fucking. Yeah. And their frame of reference is a foreign exchange student who I can only assume was played by Shannon Elizabeth in deleted scenes. <laughs> the, the irony, though, is that we do find out that he's not a good fuck. And 
his penis size is debatable because yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's small when it's soft but <laughs> it's much larger when it's hard <laughs> unlike all penises i've ever encountered everybody talks like they're a chat room in this yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I guess that's the whole idea is, you know, the gimmick, if you want to call that, and it's because people think that she's deaf, they can just say whatever they want, which which I don't know that that's something that people do with hearing impaired people. You're right. And I'm going to go deep with this for a minute. It's kind of like the anonymity of like comment boards or message boards where people are just fucking rude and mean and terrible and can say whatever they want. That's kind of what Dot is. Like she provides this anonymity for people to just say whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, Camilla Board, well, human like... message board. <laughs> Blank and waiting to be populated by obscene words. Yeah, I'd be curious, you, know, you said that Alicia Cusper did a lot of a lot of research and and, and I believe that. I think she's pretty good in this. I mean for She's for, actually pretty good. Yeah, she she seems to know what kind of movie she wants it to be. You want more of that that energy the energy in the scene when she confronts dot in the cafeteria you want more of that yeah she, throughout the she's entire got that film. like drew yeah. barrymore you know in her late teens kind of thing where where she's very aware of you know, the kind of effect she has on people but like mm-hmm. nobody else in this movie is is on that level with her and that's why it doesn't oh, work but camila bell if she spent one minute around a hearing impaired person i'd be shocked because <laughs> I, I've known one or two hearing impaired people. They don't just sit there, you know, stone faced. You know, they, they are animated <laughs> when they have to communicate. People, they are animated as someone who can hear. Yeah, they, I don't know why they are confusing they inner lives. here with frankly a little brain damaged or traumatized or 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 something like that. And she's just she, she's just absolutely just you know middle distance, constantly staring off into it. Well, the way this cafeteria scene is structured, too, it's so there's one table in the middle of all these other tables, and she's the only one sitting at it, so everyone avoids her. And then you get Katie Mixon's Michelle being like, oh, she's Z-less, and then they keep throwing the R-word her way. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of R-word in here, mm-hmm. and it was kind of still the the Dory girl at the time in terms of YA films. Like, they were still doing this up till about 2010, my issue with this scene is that there is no fucking way that she could read lips from like 15 feet away. And also Michelle is literally being blocked by Nina. So if we're to believe at this point, as we're meant to, that Dot can read lips, but she is actually deaf. Spoiler, she ain't. Mm-hmm. Right. She would not be able to read these girls' lips. She would literally just be staring at them and... It doesn't make any sense. I also find it hard to believe that she would be able to convincingly pretend to be deaf since the age of seven. Like, I get that her dad was deaf. Okay. But, like, if you hear a noise that's surprising to you, you're going to react instinctively. So I just find it hard to believe that no one has caught on to this for all this time. Yeah. The other component to this cafeteria scene is that if the idea is that Dot is able to secret these tiny conversations that no one else would hear it's taking place in a room which the entire school is Mm -hmm. and they're talking loud enough that the cafeteria workers could probably hear them there's no (laughs) intimacy or i'm hearing something that i shouldn't they're not saying anything they wouldn't say in any other circumstance and it doesn't fucking matter so this does not add to the sandwich here it just seems like a (laughs) they came up with an idea and they're like it's good enough the scenes don't have to make sense externally as long as they make sense internally i'm gonna challenge y'all on that i think that mixon while i i don't know if i would even say that she's good in this movie i would say that she's in the movie that i think this movie needs to be oh I actually do think that Mixon is really good, but you're right. Her energy level is just completely different from everybody else's. Like right. the Mean Girl reference in that one review mm-hmm. felt very on par for what she is delivering. Like you could imagine Regina George being next to her and being like, "Yeah, Connor Kennedy wants to fuck me too." It's also like it's two gay guys writing what they imagined this bitchy slutty girl to be. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and the word slut gets tossed around to the point where if you were going to have a drinking game. <laughs> oh, so many drinking games. Slut and period. You mm-hmm. would be dead. 
like and I, if I had been drinking nipples. bourbon, I would have been five hundred percent bourbon. Daddy, da- oh, da- daddy, daddy is a big one. Daddy's yeah. a big one. Oh boy, yeah. Um, well, speaking of daddy, yeah, so the next couple of scenes are all just character introductions. So we learn about Olivia, Edie Falco, she's pill addicted. We get Paul, Martin Donovan, he's very attentive to both young girls, but initially it comes off as though he's just interested in their well-being. Mm-hmm. And of course we get some backstory on Dot. Wait, you know what? Y- y'all should rewatch this movie knowing now that he's a child molester and tell me if it maybe comes across as creepy from the get-go. Just rewatch it. It's, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> I, I kind of spoiled myself on the plot a little bit, so I, I do I do go in that that he was you know he was in an incestuous relationship. He also doesn't act like he isn't in an incestuous relationship. <laughs> 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 yeah, no. I mean, I I mad props to to you know to him for just doing this right in his house. Wow. You know, I mean that that takes some. They're iron not very balls. secretive at all. Yeah, you know, it's like, oh, the wife asleep? Okay. <laughs> it's like... She's out like a light. That's all that I need. And their dynamic is less like people who have a secret relationship and more like people who have had the, their first apartment for the first month. There's a ebullience to their getaways that does not lend itself to a gross incestuous relationship that you would not want other people to know about. They're just kind of like talking they, in bed. They act more like, maybe this is, you know, that that is something I am fortunate to say I have managed to escape from. Like, I've never experienced that. But they, they kind of interact like, got like, a, you know, a pair of couples friends and one of the couples is with the other one, and they think they're doing a good job of hiding it, but everybody knows what's going on. Yeah. Because yeah. you can tell by the body language. You yeah. can tell by the looks. The movie seems to kind of waver in, you know, are they hiding this or are they not hiding this? Because I gotta say, you bring a new person into that house. Yeah, they're gonna notice. You might want to shut that down at some <laughs> point, or, you know, maybe get you a, you know, no tell motel. Yeah. I mean, I guess they figure, well, she's deaf. What's she going to know? You know? <laughs> it's like, she's not that it's deaf. It's like, well, you know, she's deaf. She's not stupid. Exactly. Which is what people seem to confuse Dot for being in this film. Like, even, I think, well-meaning Olivia, when she's not completely hopped up on pills and booze, she seems to think that if Dot isn't literally looking at her, that she has no clue what's happening. And you're just like, oh, this is not how disabled people work. I- I mean, it's it's a bit further ahead in the film, but do you want to... Your mother was a slut. Like, that whole bit? Yeah. <laughs> like, ugh! Yeah, that was weird. That that was weird. What is the definition of a slut in this movie? I guess a woman who has sex, period. Apparently, yes. Yeah. Or, or even thinks about wanting to have sex. Yeah. Slut. <laughs> but, you know, Dot's mother was a big old lucky slut. <laughs> Just one of the best in the game. When they raised her number into the rafters at the Slut Emporium, I mean, <laughs> oh, I remember it. I'm sure you all did. Maybe you had a commemorative T-shirt, but she was one of the best. So, right, you know, yeah. mad respect. It's her and Sharon Stone. She's got the pendants <laughs> rising up into the atmosphere. <laughs> Interior fireworks and spotlights and that one NBA song that goes bum ba da bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. Oh yeah, the slut anthem. Yeah, we've all heard it. Where all the sluts run into the stadium to the cheers of the crowd to be honored for their work into the slutterdome. I think you're both just thinking of the cheerleading sequence near the end of the film. God, the Slutterdome. Quiet <laughs> Camilla beyond Slutterdome. Okay, well, there's there's the tagline for this episode, the Slutterdome. <laughs> okay, go. Okay, so Dot gets partnered with Connor for biology in a fetal pig dissection scene that doesn't have any impact on anything else. So I'm assuming they had one afternoon in this set and then couldn't get it again. There is an entire featurette on the pig dissection scene of just everyone reacting to the pigs. But why? <laughs> <laughs> like so much of this film, but why? <laughs> I mean, it's a five minute featurette. I mean, again, when people call this movie pretentious, I'm like, honestly, it kind of feels like that student film pretension. Like, I mean, I went to film school. I know the types 
and it's very much like we're film students and we're doing art and we're making work and cinema and blah 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 blah. But this is so inept because you would think that this would pay off like, oh, she's good with a knife or something. And instead, yeah. <laughs> the faculty member just comes over and he's like, you don't have to hack away at it like that. You can take your time. And you're just like, oh, okay. but to be fair, she is hacking away at it. No, she is. But like in a better film, this would prove that she's like good at knife handling. And then yeah. she would use that on Paul later or something. The problem with the movie is there are no stakes. Not to say that this setup couldn't have led to a diabolique sort of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cool thriller where her secret allows her access to something and then there's a ticking clock and someone's going to die and she yes. has to do something about it or not do something about it. Which is what you think you're going to get. It keeps yeah, promising and that and then never delivering. You're waiting for her to get $1,000 so that she can move 30 miles and become a stripper. Those yeah. are the stakes. Oh, oh that cracked me stakes. up with the whole, you know, I have $1,000. That's all I need to get set up. <laughs> yeah. It's like. In 2006, in you can live like 2006, a queen. $2,006? <laughs> Because oh. I don't think that'll get you very far. Baby, that barely buys you the bus tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you buying bus tickets? I live in Canada. It's expensive to travel here. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's more nonsense with Michelle. She encourages Nina to bang Chung someone. <laughs> yeah, that's a very, uh, uh, what's that, uh, that writer's name? Juno writer. Oh, Diablo Cody. That's her Diablo Cody line. Because she's going to be a high school spinster at 17 if she's still a virgin. <laughs> she's got to lose that V-card. Meanwhile, she's getting it on the daily from Dad. <laughs> Get that Daddy D. Um, <laughs> daily Daddy D, yep. <laughs> like, her body language is really good. She's like, I'm dying to worry about this. And, you know, she just can't. And, and you know, the movie, it could have been something. And instead they wanted to be like very lurid and cheeky and vulgar and, and you can't do that with this subject. Right. No. I kind of like it. It's like us talking about it. So, okay, this is a movie about fucking like incest and child abuse and child sex. Yeah. And we're trying to like tiptoe. And I feel like that's what the movie is trying to do as well. But the problem is if you're making a movie about it, you can't tiptoe around it. Yeah, you've either got to be deadly serious and actually dramatic and not include lines like Bang Chung, mm -hmm. or you have to go full camp and go a Mittyville too. Yeah, right. Or yeah. you have to give all these characters grander motives than they have of just getting laid. Well, hmm. we'll also get to Olivia's conclusion in a bit. <laughs> Because I'm really confused by a lot of that. Yeah, I, I just feel like, the, you know, that a better, you know, moment in pop culture that handled this subject was the video for Aerosmith's Janie's Got a Gun. <laughs> which this, this seems very inspired by that. Yes. Unfortunately, Janie's Got a Gun has a ticking clock in that the song's going to be over in three minutes and 47 seconds. And there are stakes involved in it. She's on the run. The police are after her, but she's got a secret. Like, there are stakes involved in it, and here, there's no grand murder plot other than to goose somebody or to make someone feel better about themselves. They are always showing a clock in the background, like, oh my god, when it gets to midnight, something crazy's gonna happen, and nothing fucking crazy ever happens. Well, I think that's actually just, oh shit, we need to shoot more scenes because we're going to lose this set because we can't afford to shoot here again tomorrow. <laughs> that very No, that, that very much is what it is. Because, yeah, they had to change some things again on the fly because they were like, oh, we need to do this. We don't have time because we only have like the bedroom in the house for two days. I was going to say, they, they love that shot of that piano in an empty room, didn't they? They do. Oh, yeah. And, and, and this is actually like an, a million dollar home in Austin that like they were able to use because, again, fucking $900,000 budget. Yeah. This movie definitely takes place in a house. You will believe a house exists in this movie. It's true. Yes. It may even have a basement, and it possibly has a rented piano. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's just a lot of scenes like this early in the film, where it's like, we get this brief glimpse of Nina talking about how she wants to run away. We get scenes of Dot practicing Beethoven on the piano. And talking about Beethoven and a talking lot. talking about fucking oh. Beethoven. 
every time I had to hear Camilla Bell's voice. I hate voiceover at the best of times. I think it's a lazy narrative construction. Like, you can't figure out a way to give some interior life right. to this character. So you literally have to have them tell you. But here, it just, the voiceover doesn't add anything. Yeah, wouldn't it have been better if the first time we heard her speak, minus when Nina finds out at the piano, right. was when she kills Paul? Wouldn't that have been better? No, for yeah. sure. For sure. I mean, that's a stake that Patrick's talking about. Like, that would actually heighten dramatic tension. Well, and this maybe not in slow-mo, but we'll get there in a minute. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> no, wait, no, wait. People are going to think that they accidentally hit the slow-mo on their podcatcher. <laughs> that half speed going on <laughs> sidebar i have listened to us at half speed and it is horrifying so i don't <laughs> recommend it at all oh Ew. no i i can't do that with my enunciation problems yeah. right yeah i think that me at half speed just sounds like a person at normal speed this is true yes it's <laughs> trace without the speed yeah <laughs> Okay, yeah, basically it all comes to a head, a bunch of shit happens, but not really, <laughs> and then one day Nina comes home and she realizes that, <gasps> shockingly enough, Dot is not actually deaf because something has gone wrong at the piano and she hears Dot say shit. So she fakes her entrance and she comes back in and then they basically have this eye-staring fuck-down moment <laughs> where it's like, I know what you are, and yet nothing comes of that at that scene. She waits until the next day. <laughs> I have to read two things. So first of all, we get really good insight from Dot about how the world works. And it's one day we wake up and we realize the world sucks. And we suck for being in it. And we run away. Anything but to face ourselves as we are. Anything to avoid asking why we hate ourselves so much. Okay. Paired with Nina at Dot going, look at you, eating your sandwich like a piglet while I talk. <laughs> <laughs> This movie has so many levels. <laughs> they are I still like it. thinly sliced right at the bottom, very close to one another, but not quite layered on top of one another. Yes, layers. Yeah. I mean, I will say this cafeteria scene where Nina just <laughs> leans over and unleashes the truth, where she talks about how daddy fucks her and she loves it, but she also hates it and she's going to get a gun and she's going to kill him. And you're just thinking, here we go. The film is about to take off. That earlier shit was a little bit slow, but from now on, it's full steam ahead to crazy town. Mm hmm. And then nothing happens. <laughs> the problem is, it's Alicia Cuthbert delivering it, but the movie continues as if Camilla Bell delivered that monologue, which is yeah. a really good monologue. And I actually think it's filmed really well by Babbitt. Like, I think it's mostly one take. It's mostly just up in Cuthbert's face. Mm -hmm. It is really cool. I mean, the nipple stuff gets a little weird. It's a little weird. Yeah, we yeah. need to talk about the nipple stuff, guys. Um, I mean, this is why we brought you on, to talk about the nipple stuff. <laughs> We're nipple stuff experts by this point, aren't we, Gina? We've we've had lots of nipple stuff. In case you need a refresher, I would say this so, is Camilla yeah. Bell reciting yeah, these yeah. lines. <laughs> he likes it when I bite his nipples, though. I stick the tip of his nipple between my teeth, and I rub my tongue back and forth on it like a windshield wiper. It drives him <laughs> wild. Oh, oh, my God. I even made him come once just by sucking on his nipples. I didn't even have to touch his dick once. Okay, that see, that is either a brag or she's just making it up. Well, then she, like, sucks on her finger. <sighs> Not enough. Like, it needs more finger sucking. It's true. Nipple play and finger sucking is what this movie needs. I just don't know what else to think of this. I mean, I suppose there are people who would find it titillating. But I'm just like, am I supposed to be shocked by this? Am I, I mean, yeah, obviously it's shocking she's talking about her father. But... Well, she's talking about an actor playing her father. It doesn't, like, I don't know, it doesn't have that same resonance, I guess. It's one of those moments where I feel like, and this happens a lot sometimes in movies, where I feel like the filmmaker is poking me, like, are you shocked yet? Are you shocked? Am I shocking you yet? Yeah. I was very frustrated the entire time with Nina because I was like, why don't you just try to be friends with this girl? Like, you both have kind of a trauma thing going on. And y'all could talk about it i mean well no like i don't know it, it felt like the whole movie is about nina's con against dot because she knows her secret when it should have been about these two girls 
ganging up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we get that for two minutes at the end. There's this scene where it seems like Nina is opening up and now that's going to happen. And then there are other scenes and maybe it's just like they were shot out of order, which is how a lot of films are shot. Right, where she's friendly and then not and then friendly and then not. Yeah, and there's no consistency to it. It's like I go to bed and we're spooning and you make me stop crying. And then I wake up the next day and I look pissed off and I iron a teddy bear's face and throw it at you. Well, I kind of got the impression that maybe you're supposed to, it was in a way that she was worried that, you know, she was going to replace her with the dad. Mm. I don't, I didn't get that, but. Oh, but there is the scene with Martin Donovan's Paul literally caressing Dot's hair. And that's yeah. when Nina is away at right. Michelle's house. But right? that's when he, that's when he confesses to her though and says, I'm sick, Dot, right? But I, yeah. I think the implication is that given enough time, he, he would try to molest Dot as right. well. Well, and that would make sense, I think, right? Well, you, you know, he, he doesn't have much going on at work, so his <laughs> calendar is free once he hits the homestead. So Yeah, I was going to say, for an architect, he all he really does is just kind of sit around his dinner table and try to pretend to be a normal <laughs> yeah. dad. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. While just, like, creeping is just, like, oozes out of his Very forest. bad at it. And, and that that's another movie this could have been, is... That because Nina knows Dot's secret, she could have connived away, even though she's she's not being uh, molested by her dad, but there's enough weird closeness because of the mom's withdrawing that yeah. she's going to use this situation to make Dot do something mm-hmm. when there's not actually something going on. Hey! Now you got a well, movie, she keeps pussing baby. Out. She keeps pussing out, not doing anything. <laughs> but that's yeah. the thing. I thought that she was manipulating Dot. Like, she was saying, I'm going to kill him, and I'm going to kill him at this time. And I thought that Dot was going to try to stop it and inadvertently kill him. And that would have been Nina's plan all along. Like, I want you to kill him, and I'm going to pretend like I didn't want it to happen, and then you're going to do the dirty work. So far, we've come up with ten better movies than the movie we oh, have. Oh, for sure. For well, sure. <laughs> we don't have to gloss on it too much, because I don't want to go, like, go back too far. But, like, we are forgetting the scene where Michelle and Nina are watching porn, and then there's the whole, how do you know if you're a good kisser conversation. Like, there's this whole subplot with Michelle that I think Jamie Babbitt really wants to tell, but it comes to nothing. Yeah. yeah. Which is one of the things that reviewers really gleaned onto. It's like, oh, there's a homo repressed cheerleader in this film. And I literally was like, who are they talking about? Are they suggesting Nina's a coded lesbian? Oh, they're talking about that one single scene with Michelle. <laughs> but the thing is, though, it's not just reviewers, because even the writers mentioned that she's a repressed lesbian in the commentary. And I want to say Babbitt dabbles in it, too. There's just, there's not enough of that Mm -hmm. here yeah again it feels like ooh, let's shock the audience you know maybe i'll make out at some point which you know 2006 was still a time where you've got like the Katy perry song where where the the performative lesbianism was you know strictly oh like his girl yeah for for hetero male audience members Mm -hmm. yeah that's the only reason that would have existed now i mean for me i i thought all the you know, chemistry, if you want to call what, what Camila Bell is, is projecting, <laughs> is between Nina and Dot. Like, like, like certainly yeah. the scene after they bury bloody clothes, they, they look like they're about to just fall into each other's arms. Yeah, and, oh, for and, sure. I mean, presumably that's intentional, but, yeah. you know, if they were, again, if they were going to go with that element, they should have, for lack of a better phrase, gone all the way with it. Yeah. If they were, if they were trying to be that, make it, you know, all, you know, shocking the normies. They should have gone with it instead of you know, dancing around it. Yeah, like go with wild things. If you're going to pretend exactly. to be wild things, go wild things. This very much wanted to be wild things. Yes. Exactly. Ooh, yeah. They needed to take Connor's advice and finally put it all the way in. Yeah, it all the way in. <laughs> this is Sony Pictures Classics. They don't have wild things. <laughs> this shit is classy, y'all. Come on. <laughs> yeah, God. and yeah, and. Talk about class. I think we we did breeze by. It would not be a kill by kill guest appearance if we did not bring up a little bit of background magic. And that is the moment in which Dot makes a call to child services Oof. from apparently Dickensian London, <laughs> <laughs> a foggy brick lane street with the old fashionedest public phone I've ever seen in my life that does not have a coin slot. It just is out and about for you to use in 2006. 
Austin slash Connecticut. I cannot confirm nor deny because I did not live in Austin until the year 2008. <laughs> it just looks like something out of a high school drama closet. Yeah, like did it have wheels on it and they pushed it to where they needed <laughs> that's it to be? Right. Just looks like a flat that's been painted well. It was <laughs> mm, a little sad. I mean, I appreciate the attempts at authenticity because I got so fucking tired of staring at the blank art design of this apparently interior decorated house that they're living in. Olivia is an interior decorator, but she's only working on their own house. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah? She doesn't want to take on other clients because, you know, interior she's decorating build up. is hard. But, like, she's gotten certain rooms completely done, and then other rooms are just in a constant state of, we've got the plastic down, there's no furniture, but... I think what that might have been, though, was like, oh, we don't really like the way this house looks, and we don't want to, like, refurnish it, so we're just going to do this with it instead. But you should use, like, I kept thinking, the plastic sheeting... It's going to come into play here. No. They're going to roll a body up in it. You murder somebody and you ramp them up in the plastic and then, oh my God, what are we going to do with the body? Mm -hmm. Why won't you talk to me? Yep. All those things that we're talking about a movie that doesn't exist and what we do have is this. Yeah. Deepak Chopra Winfrey. (laughs) Oh God. (laughs) (laughs) The thing that just grabs you right away is that monologue of Connor where he's talking about your hair smells like cucumber and last yep. night I got hard, very okay. hard. Let's jump to that. But I do have, <laughs> again, there's the part where Connor comes in the house. Yeah, I want to talk about that part. I want to talk about that part. Well, no, because Edie Falco's like, Dot, what are you going to do with her? What are you going to do with her? Uh-huh. Like They make the it sound free- like he's going to abduct her and rape her and murder her. <laughs> And you're like, he's literally just some guy who showed up to, like, take her to study. He said, I'm in her lab. <laughs> but then, like, he could be a fucking freak. But you let him in the house. <laughs> the dialogue See, is that, That's all some over camp that I'm like, oh, more of that, please. And then Martin Donovan, in the only realistic thing in this entire movie, is all angry, like, you can't contradict me. If I say that you can't do something, then you're like, no, you can. Like, I have no authority anymore. Of course, yeah. he has enough authority to constantly be having sex with his own <laughs> daughter. Yeah. But 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 Nina has monetized that to the point where she constantly, like, give me things so I don't say anything. And that is another part of the film that, that they delve into, but it also, like, doesn't really come to much. Because it just, I don't know, like... Not that I enjoy seeing, like, this child who is being raped by her father, like, manipulate him. Mm -hmm. But, like, that's what she's doing. Absolutely. If that that were the thing, if she, again, in another movie that is not this movie, if she was that person who could manipulate her best friend who has lesbian tendencies and manipulate her father who's lonely because his wife is sort of disconnected with him because of drugs and lure dot into doing something she wouldn't normally do because she knows her secret then Mm -hmm. that's a movie yeah but that's not the movie we have instead we get michelle with do you think my nipples are abnormally big (laughs) (laughs) well i really have to see them to to find out but i never do so there we go yeah, that's go. a conversation yeah. I never had with, with my female friends when I was that age. I never just whipped out a boob and said, does this look normal to you? Well, but she's trying to fuck Nina. <laughs> Gina, that makes me so sad. <laughs> you never had young teenage friends who would show you their boobs and their nipples? I did not. I mean, I just feel like something was missing from your life, Gina. I think you should feel pretty bad about that, right? <laughs> well, I, I did not until now, but she was. <laughs> Well, you know, I think it's something to talk with your therapist about because it's all I could talk about with my friends in high school, (laughs) what our nipples looked like (laughs) and whether or not they were okay or not okay. And we all had opinions and oh my God, some people's opinions were really out to lunch. And then there was one guy who was very accurate. Mark knew his nipples. (laughs) Do you think it's because someone had sucked on them and made him come without touching his dick? I can't say for certain, but if anyone... Would all of you say that you know your nipples? I mean, I've had them for a pretty long time, so, you know, I mean, I'm kind of <laughs> used to them. I could, I could identify them out of a, a lineup, I would suppose, yeah. 
Well, wait, wait, wait. How are we identifying them? Is it like just the tits <laughs> in like a little viewfinder and we have no, no, to like no. hear close? Tit implies the entire like chesticle area. No, I'm no. talking about like just the nipple. Like a, Nips like a close only. up okay. of just the nipple. So just the hard areolas erasers. are uh, Optional? allowed in this, correct? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yes, areolas okay. are allowed. But like, you know, for me, I have like very tiny nipples with like maybe five strands of hair on each one. So it's pretty easy to pick out, I think. Uh, okay. Wow. Tiny nipples. <laughs> like smaller than a dime. It's not even funny. Oh, wow. I mean, maybe someone laughed. I don't know. <laughs> Gina's laughing. <laughs> what is Nina going to do with those? She's not going to be able to get you off with tiny nipples. It actually probably fits in the space between her teeth. Oh, there, see, there you go. There well, you go. then I think I think you guys would make a great match. There you You're go. both in the Austin area, so <laughs> why why aren't we making? Well, no, this happen? movie takes place in Connecticut, despite being filmed in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> it has such a presence. Yeah, I remember she was going to she was going to take off for parts unknown, like New Haven. <laughs> Where you could take the law into your own hands and and just really you know live an outlaw life, New yeah. Haven. Yep. On your on your thousand dollars that you <laughs> that you conned your incestuous father out of. A thousand dollars. Oh That's my what's god. At stake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, girl, you're gonna run out of that money so fast. Yeah. Is that supposed to be social commentary on how dumb she is? Like she has no concept so. of what money is. Yeah, I mean, I think that she's just, like, really naive, and, and she's you know, wealthy, so she doesn't really know the value. Again, but why do I want to, why do I, as an audience member, want to sit there and go, boy, that young girl who's being taken advantage of by her own father, she's real dumb. Yeah, what a dumb bitch. <laughs> right. Why are you putting that on me? <laughs> I don't why am I made to feel this that. way? Well, again, it's worth mentioning that there's not a single decent character in this entire movie. No. I mean, no. even even Connor, who has no reason to no. be portrayed as a creep, yeah. is probably among the creepiest he people in the movie. When so he's like hard. staring at her and telling her that he likes that she's quiet. And yeah. she's like and a she doll. And she reminds him of a doll. And it's just oh like, doll. Are, you gonna, line. are you going to murder this girl? <laughs> You want to bring this further element into it. I think it. that you can remove this character from this movie and fill that space with more, like, better scenes. Like, with Nina dot scenes. Yeah. Yeah, he's not He's not you know, relevant to the script. Like I said, they get a clumsy sex scene in which Dot awkwardly tries to bite his nipple. Because, again, they, they, they <laughs> treat her Ooh, like, yeah. she's, like she's feral. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Like, she, it's like she's been spending time in, like, a sanatorium before, you know, her godparents showed up to to adopt her. She just doesn't know how to act with people. She doesn't know how to appear to be a normal person. Nope. But then, you know, she tells her, oh, by the way, you know, I'm not actually deaf. And he's like, oh, fuck you, and walks away. <laughs> That's yeah. the end of him. <laughs> and, it's like, and it's like his plot is absolutely irrelevant. Yeah. And here's the thing. This movie is 96 minutes long. If they're really going for, like, fucking art house prestige drama thing should be two hours they could have yeah they could have gone and granted i mean i'm sure for y'all y'all like blessed be that it's not two hours long (laughs) (laughs) i'll take it but but well well, i'll wait until we get to the end i feel like there's so much left of this movie that we just don't get resolution to no okay so they go out for milkshakes and he apparently gets super fucking hard at her trying to order a chocolate shake I've this, got a this guy for is you, such a fucking fuckboy. Yeah, again, like, like we go to this labored read either. What, what is the movie trying to imply? If she can't speak, <laughs> you, you point at the you know menu. You don't have the waitress. Yo, know, yo, know, strawberry, vanilla, <laughs> oh. chocolate. Well, it's good because they think that <laughs> if if you speak slower, it's easier to read lips. Didn't you know? There are three flavors of milkshakes and the milkshake deciding scene Mm -hmm. takes no less than (laughs) one minute and 25 seconds (laughs) i just don't know why 
just doesn't point. Uh, just point. Just point. Yes. It, it, it's like it's like when you're at a, it's like when you're at a restaurant and you can't pronounce the non-English name of the dish, so you say to the waiter, "Ah, oh, that." Yeah. And and they know what you're talking about. I think about. the implication was though that it just said milkshake and the flavors were not listed, which really means the restaurant is to blame in this scenario. <laughs> what kind of shit ass <laughs> diner is that? <laughs> They can barely afford to keep the lights on. It, no, it's it's like if you go to a restaurant and they have ice cream. Like they're not gonna have fifty flavors of ice cream listed. Well, no, no restaurant has fifty flavors of ice cream. Ooh, but ooh, still, ooh. you get my drift. Oh wait, do you think that Connor took her to some place that has like eighty five different flavors in the hope that he could just like wank off as she's like, which one is it gonna be chocolate? Is it gonna be macadamia <laughs> cream? No, oh, no, 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 oh, no, yeah. not yet. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Do you what want a weird it malted? <laughs> <laughs> Just a minute, let me pinch my tiny fetish. nipple. <laughs> Do you have any sort of um, uh, tweezers or like a clamp to get chicken out of a pot? I could use those, maybe. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> a turkey baster that I could apply suction to them? I mean, anything. Just keep... Naming off oh, shake God. flavors. No, we we can't talk about turkey basters because then I just get into like don't breathe territory and I don't want to mm. go there. <laughs> we'll have to cover that one day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so then we get the scene where Dot comes home after this gross milkshake date and she <laughs> hears Nina in bed with Paul. So she orchestrates the destruction of what, like an art piece or something. And this is the moment when they should team up. And there's an eye acting between both actresses that's like, cool, yeah. we get it. Yeah, like, we're going to clean up the shards of this glass, and then we're going to fuck, and then we're going to kill your dad. Yeah. But then that goes away in the next day. <laughs> yeah, like, they, they climb into bed together, and then Dot just wakes up, and it looks like Nina has had a complete personality transplant, and she's mm-hmm. like, I'm going to kill my dad tonight. Press, press, press on this teddy bear's face <laughs> with the iron. <laughs> Which the setting for that iron must be way too hot to iron your cheerleader's uniform if it can leave a teddy bear that blackened. Mm -hmm. This person doesn't know how to iron. They're all so dumb and (laughs) they're not good self-starters. Look, she's bad with money. She's bad with ironing. (laughs) (laughs) But they can't get their own planes up and running. You know what I mean? It's no wonder. I'm surprised that Dot and Nina do all their homework. We never see this happen, but they're always like, I did it this afternoon. Here's our chemistry homework. It's like, when the fuck did you do that? You're never starting your own anything else in this movie. How come you're so great at homework? Yeah. It's like Nina's only actually good at pop quizzes. And even then she's only getting B (laughs) minuses. I thought you'd at least want to support me, daddy. (laughs) Oh, she's getting support, all right. I thought it was a good thing, Daddy. Mm. <laughs> okay, so so let's get to this pièce de résistance. Do we have anything else that we want to talk about about the pool sex scene? I would like to read this via Camilla Bell as well. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is, is Trace got feedback from somebody that they love his dramatic readings, and now we all have to suffer through Camilla Bell dramatic readings. Yeah, but there are too many f- great the lines dialogue. in this movie. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. What what this guy tells her is, I got really, really hard last night. I had to beat <laughs> off, and my mom was just outside of my room putting the towels away. You know, I could hear her, but I couldn't help myself. I mean... I came four times. Four times. That isn't normal, is it? And then we get this, like, you know, I've never done it. Stuck it inside. (laughs) But, like, the use of the word it suggests sex, but then he immediately follows that up by saying, stick it inside, which is a reference to his penis. And it's like, sir, which it are you speaking of? (laughs) But this scene is intercut with Edie Falco's nude scene. Yes. And yeah. that's the weird thing to me. I mean, we're the, the weirdest thing about all of this to me. <laughs> Whereas it would actually make sense if it was intercut with Nina and Paul having sex, because the suggestion is that people are having sex and like illicit sex right on the other side of a door where normalcy is happening. Putting away towels, standing by statues. 
it doesn't make sense to intercut this with Olivia having her weird sexual breakdown and cry on the floor topless. Mm. That's not the scene that goes with this. I'm just realizing I have a fourth page of notes just on this whole sequence. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Because I was just flabbergasted watching it. Like, I remember it and I was like, what is what, what is coming out of this actor's mouth? It feels like they deliberately cast Sean Ashmore because he's so cute and normal looking. And this idea that, oh my God, he's a sexual deviant just like Paul. <laughs> he's masturbating four times. Ooh. He is cute, but when he tries to be angry, he looks like a Chucky doll. And <laughs> it's not a great look for him. Okay, this is going to sound really mean, but... Don't you think that this role is something more deserving of, like, his brother Aaron? Wow. (laughs) The disdain. (laughs) I just, like, I mean, Sean is the more famous Ashmore twin. This seems a bit not really for him. Maybe he's Alicia Cuthberting, and he's trying to step outside of his usual... But you can only have one person Alicia Cuthberting. (laughs) Well... Clearly. (laughs) He is fighting... For this role, and I see it, and God bless him for delivering these lines with a straight face. Because uh, you don't know, is the script this dumb, or is he that dumb? And that is the beauty of cinema. That's that the beauty of the quiet. Acting. Cinema! It's seamless. <laughs> More movies need to be like the quiet. Oh Make God. movies the quiet again. <laughs> More movies need to make you ask, is the script or is he really just as stupid? (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay, so we get this horribly awkward sex scene. It honestly looks like Dot could be sleeping or maybe (laughs) is thinking about puking. I think Camilla Bell was sleeping during the filming. Like, she's mastered the art of sleeping with her eyes open. (laughs) Yeah, she's like my labradoodle. Wait, did Camilla Bell study at the Rooney Mara school of... Uh... <laughs> well, it's Snoozy Mara and Camilla Board. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, lesbian road trip movie. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> the, the charisma exuding from the film prints of whatever movie that is? <laughs> Good news, everybody. We don't need to give you sleep aids anymore. We've got this new movie coming up with Snoozy Mara and Camilla Boring. <laughs> Her straight off the set of that Nightmare remake that convinced her to stop acting, and then she didn't. Yeah. And here, yeah. we have Camilla Bell, who didn't want to stop acting. And, and did. And everyone in town's like, no, nah, I think you gotta put that down. <laughs> We're gonna put you back in your box. <laughs> put her down! Put her down! <laughs> Just, mm, no, I mean, thank you, but no thank you. Maybe Connor's comment that she's like a doll was apt. Maybe this is meta commentary, folks. I mean, I think Connor really does want a woman who, A, will just sit there and listen to him prattle on, and B, not know what he's talking about and not talk back. That is his perfect woman. I just wish the movie was more interested in like exploring how shitty of a person this guy is. Yeah. And it doesn't like honestly he never really gets a comeuppance the movie never really seems to admonish his behavior whatsoever and that's really upsetting to me it's so bizarre if someone opened the door into his face i'd be like oh god finally right that doesn't even happen he's just another creepy person in the movie in a movie filled with creepy people but like his arc ends with him kind of winning yeah he tells dot to fuck off and that's it it feels like the movie agreeing with him like yeah she is shitty for lying to him he told her all his secrets and how could she betray him and you're like wait what no where was the betrayal like she listened and didn't say anything about it literally (laughs) he's like why Why were you saying them to begin with? Like, that's even worse. Yeah. Therapy, son. Go to a therapist. Stop <laughs> fetishizing milkshakes, you dumb fuck. And do- I didn't human do doll well people. At basketball tonight. <laughs> tonight of all nights. 
I mean, like, let your little, little size issues with your dick go away <laughs> and just fucking deal with it. I mean, everyone in this movie needs therapy. Like, nobody's oh, business. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a therapist could have solved all of this. Yeah, it really could. I mean, may- maybe maybe not whatever Paul was dealing with, which was, mm. you know, child lust. Mm. But everyone else probably could have come out. Yeah. Okay, so Dot sees that it's almost midnight, and she's got to run home. So she just abandons Connor at the pool. Cool, whatever. (laughs) Then when Nina is about to iron Paul's face... (laughs) And then doesn't! And then doesn't. Like, weren't you all just like, just put it to his face. Just like, touch it to his nose a little bit. (laughs) Give me a little little sear. He's just sitting there, eyes closed, I'm waiting for my surprise. Yeah. How long long are you going to do that? Like, like if if someone tells you to close your eyes, how long are you going to sit there with your eyes closed like a dumbass? (laughs) <laughs> to feel the heat radiating off this thing too like does he think that she's just gonna give him a little facial Ooh, <laughs> it, yeah you mm-hmm. would feel that and then again another excellent line delivery of her going i don't want a baby with webbed feet running around the house daddy <sighs> oh my god I love he is it. remarkably composed for mm-hmm. oh by the way i'm pregnant with our incest baby yeah yeah i did love his his moment where he's like basically the equivalent of are you sure it's mine <laughs> i was like <laughs> oh wow daddy <laughs> yeah it's yours i mean how often do y'all think that they're having like bedroom sessions oh he's Too doing it times. every night every, every night? night okay i feel like this movie takes place over what a week and he's fucking her on the regular I mean, clearly, because all of her friends know that her mom goes to bed by, like, 9 p.m. Because they just think that she can get out of her house whenever she wants after 9 p.m. Yeah. (laughs) Also, how long would you sit on a bed with your eyes closed and then the person says, I'm pregnant? My first reaction (laughs) would be, why did I have to close my eyes? Yeah, Yeah, where's the surprise in that? And why did it involve closing my eyes? (laughs) Your sperm met my ova, and I didn't want you to see it just out of the side of your eye. Like, that's not how pregnancy works. That's not how anything works. And this movie is gross. Oh, my God. He just opens his eyes, and she's, like, pulled down a chart. And she's like, here's what's happened to my ovaries. (laughs) Now, it's definitely attached to the wall. She just gets Camilla Bell to come in and open her mouth, and a projector turns on. Just an urban legend Human projector, style Camilla Bell. <laughs> oh, we are the meanest people. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to put it out there. Because like, there's always a chance Camilla Bell will listen to, us, to this. Although, I, I, I feel confident. <laughs> Please, Camilla, listen to this. We're no. friends. <laughs> Anyone involved with this movie, if they listen to this, they'll probably get about 10 minutes in and be done. I don't yeah. think they're going to make it this far into the episode. But if you did... Alicia Cuthbert, I love you. Oh, 100%. <laughs> oh, listen, Alicia Cuthbert is a very, very talented comedian, and they recently did that little over Skype version of Happy Ending. Oh, mm-hmm. so good. And she was fucking hilarious. So funny. She's great. I love she her. She is great in that role, and they found a way to make her vibe read very, very funny. Mm-hmm. And the problem here is that everyone started attaching themselves to the idea of this script when the script needed to be more than just individual ideas. Yeah. yeah. It feels kind of sitcom-y, right? But, yes. like, not funny. Like, remember back when HBO was making really black kind of deadpan comedies? Oh, yeah. I feel like, Gina, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I absolutely do. It feels like one of those... I think they, you know, they had a lot of ideas that they could have run with, and and they went with this. Yep, 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 yep. I mean, I just, I'm thinking about, like, all the ways that, like, they could have done something with Connor, where he was actually kind of a decent guy, and upon what they were doing, and, you know, oops, you gotta be killed, too. I, I think in the very yeah. end, they want you to sympathize with Dot and Nina, and I think, you know, it would have been... In keeping with the kind of slightly sleazy, horrid tone of the movie, if you had them just killing every fucking buddy, you know, cover up what they did, what have you. Yeah. You know what? 
the house or the school or both should have blown up at the end. Oh, we don't have a budget for that. Come on. <laughs> yeah, there needed there need to be there need to be more killing. Yes. And and instead you've got this absolutely you got this absolutely absurd they go to the dance to oh do my God. when you when you Why? murder somebody, you go to the big dance. I will not lie, I forgot that happened. Like, when they kill Paul, I was like, okay, cool, it's done. Because I remember that they, they cart the mom out, whatever. And I was like, wait, there's still 15 minutes left of this movie? <laughs> oh, no, what? there's the, the dire threat that yeah, someone they, will look in that red Yeah, they go to the dance backpack. with their evidence bag. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my, oh God. my God, So, the red I, I, I'm going to ask a question of the three of you. Sure. Do you think that Camila Bell is trying to strangle a grown man with piano wire? No. Mm, well, she's got the leverage on the back. Though. She does I take mean, a running leap. Yeah. Well, all right. Yeah. That, that's and fair. She's pulling back. I uh, know. I, I think. I think it because it cuts through his neck. I think it's the. I think she essentially slits his throat, not strangles him, and that is more believable. Well, okay. That's yeah. That's fair. But there does need to be more blood for that. Yeah, they don't have the production budget to convincingly pull it off, so you get, like, a couple of drops. I was hoping for, honestly, I I was very disappointed that we didn't get a Byzantium where she, like, pulls the piano wire all the way through his neck and his head falls off. Now, see, that would have gotten gotten an extra star for me if that happened. Well, because no, that, that would have been, like, the film building up to, like, essentially an orgasm, which is the spray of blood coming out of his neck all over Nina as she's, like, being bathed in his blood. Well, I mean, we do we do get a little bit of this, and I won't lie, the minute that blood started to drip on her, I was like, oh, is this the film being like, oh, he gets one last shot at <laughs> his daughter? <laughs> so, we're here. Let, let's discuss this. Do we like this attempted rape scene? slash kill scene which is like intercut with a bunch of garbage as olivia watches tv about like a fire and <laughs> but, but, but she hears everything like she knows yeah. that her husband is about to rape her daughter that's when the movie is at artsiest when 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 they're intercut with, yeah. with olivia just staring at you know the world on fire oh yeah it's american yeah. beauty well i i feel that they didn't trust the audience to hate paul enough right <laughs> which again i think that it would have been a better more discomforting scene if they killed him when he was being nice you know when he was trying to be a regular dad or like here you go right? maybe they poison him or something yes at, at one of their fucking family dinners yeah but no it has to be rape rape is the drawing right, line where you, dot you, finally takes action yeah consensual sex she's okay with. well also because you have <laughs> dot playing moonlight sonata oh also callback joe so we, obviously the moonlight sonata is a callback to um what keeps you alive mm-hmm but also our diegetic and non-diegetic conversation from Tenebrae last week, mm-hmm. because it starts out with Dot playing Moonlight Sonata, and that is diegetic, and then when she decides to go kill Paul, then Moonlight Sonata continues playing in a non-diegetic way. Mm-hmm. And another Garot scene. Basically, this is Tenebrae part two. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't oh, plan this, listeners. <laughs> we promise. Oh, please. Like, we could have planned this. <laughs> this movie desperately wants to be what the perfection ultimately mm. is. Yeah, I would think of that mm. too. They reminded me when they're sitting next to each other on the piano bench, yeah, I was like, I saw this movie yes. last year. Yeah. But that movie was explicitly queer. Yes. Which again, like, the perfection is a movie directed by a straight man, co-written by a gay man and a presumably straight woman. This one is filled with queer creators and it's just like, not crossing that line. Maybe it's a time period. Maybe it's because it's 2006. It was a time period. They, I, I think yeah. that, that, although again, you know, Wild Things was like, what, like 99, I think? But that that was to titillate the boys. Like, the perfection is not to titillate. Oh, the well, no, 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 I think no, is, no, no, Yeah, and, and I don't think that Jamie Babbitt or these two gay guys that are writing this movie are here to titillate straight men. Well, I, I think, think this is the problem, right? We've got queer creators who, for some reason, we don't know entirely why they decided to take this particular approach, but I think by hampering the inherent queerness of this story, we end up with this flaccid dick of a pitcher that just doesn't do anything. And it, it worked in Because I'm a Cheerleader because she went camp. She embraced her queer sensibilities. And I'm not suggesting that if you're a queer filmmaker, you have to be campy and outrageous. Mm -hmm. But like, if you're going with this kind of material and you're inferring queerness and you're inferring tawdry luridness and then you try to release it as a Sony Pictures classic film, like the dichotomies are off the charts with this and it doesn't work as a result. Did y'all watch the trailer for this? 
No. Uh, no. I okay. mean, I, I kind of remembered it from back in the day, mm-hmm. which heavily implied a lot of lesbian undertones. Yes. It starts out with piano, like your Sony Pictures classics, but then there's a point where they kind of like tease a bit of the cafeteria confrontation, and then it's like electric guitar, like, banner. Okay. And it's like a super cut of like quote unquote suspenseful tense scenes to make it look like a thriller. Yeah. Which I'm sure helped its box office then. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know, like, because this isn't a studio film, you know, like this, this isn't a studio saying, oh, tone back on the lesbianism, tone mm-hmm. back on the queerness, tone back on the incest. So it's a choice on these people's parts. I'm assuming, again, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Were they like, oh, well, 2005, six audiences aren't ready for this intensity. I don't I don't know. It, 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 it's a very mind boggling scenario to me. Or like we need to be taken seriously. So we have to play it straight. Right. But they also don't do that. No, they don't play it straight. And I just wish they would have committed one way or the other. I think it's the vacillating between the two and writing these different lanes that really mm-hmm. gets them into trouble. Well, it's yeah. it, when Edie Falco walks in and she goes, it's a miracle. Doc can speak. <laughs> and she's not yeah. phased by her dead husband's body. Like, right. Again, like that, that's something mean, like, what movie is this? <laughs> well, okay. So Trace, you keep coming back to this Olivia thing. And part of this is we haven't touched on it, but I think it's pretty obvious that The reason that Olivia is the way she is is because she is self-medicating to deal with the fact that she knows her husband is raping her daughter. Right, yeah. So, like, obviously all of her reactions are going to be unusual because she is not processing things properly because she is under the influence this entire movie. So Mm any time that you see Olivia, it feels weird because she is a person who is basically not dealing with reality. But then the movie thinks that her arc is completed and that she is automatically forgiven by turning herself in for her husband's murder when yes. she literally could just say he was trying to rape my daughter yeah, and I killed him. Mm-hmm. No, she would rather send both girls into the foster care system yes. because they're underage still <laughs> and they have no other family. Yeah, I- Go back into the house, like, immediately afterwards. That's my favorite thing in this movie, is when someone is brutally murdered, and this is something that happened a lot in the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, and I always mm-hmm. griped about it, is that somebody was murdered in the house, and you just went right back yeah. into it. Well, what do you do? It's not a, it's, apparently, it's not a no. crime scene. You don't need to be questioned. We don't need any follow-up. You're good. It's like, we know who did it, and you know, case closed. Hey, I mentioned this earlier, but how do y'all feel about... Because, again, Dot knows. Dot knows that this man is molesting his daughter Mm -hmm. in the house that she's staying in. We get that fucking phone call to child services scene. I don't like this implication. I mean, you can argue, okay, so Dot is also traumatized, and she doesn't know what she's doing, and she's a minor, and blah, blah, blah. But she... Is the film also saying that she's kind of to blame because she doesn't do shit (laughs) about this? I guess it's the pr- the price that she's paying for the ruse that she can't hear anything is yeah. also not a victimless crime, I suppose. I don't know. I, I don't know. And, and then at one point, they try to make Paul into a sympathetic character. You're like, why? Why? <laughs> why on earth would you make me try to say, oh, boy, Paul just gets it coming and going. Like, what the fuck? It's very much like, oh, I can see how he would just decide to go rape his daughter. Like, I, I get it. He's been he faced with enough, but I understand. Yeah, that's unforgivable. Oh. No, it's just a mess. It's a fucking mess. And if it all had the same over-the-top attitude as Paul's death scene, it would be a different movie and a more interesting one. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is not. Mm-hmm. No. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else you folks want to highlight, but more or less, that's kind of the end of the film. Like, Connor doesn't get his comeuppance. They hide the evidence by burying the dress. We get a little bit of closure about why Dot decided to pretend to be deaf, and it was to be closer to her dad, who she feels responsible for. And I'm never a fan of saying a film is pretentious, but, like, some of that shit is very pretentious. My only, like, takeaway with this, and again, it's a bad movie, and I will admit that. I still like a lot about it, and I think there's stuff here that's worth talking about. Obviously, we talked about it for an hour and a half. I just wish the focus had been on these two girls and their Mm -hmm. relationship. 
Yeah. It doesn't need to be complicated, and this movie complicates it. Let's forget the tone. Let's forget how it just doesn't know what it wants to be. It adds so many mixtures to the, so many ingredients to this fucking pot. And you're just like, these girls are your protagonists. Like, we get that moment, even when they're burying the backpack. Even when they're walking out of the the dance and Dot's like, we have to go do this now. And, like, we get this interaction between them that we haven't really seen before, Mm -hmm. minus the the, the eye acting after, like, Dot breaks the statue. And I wanted more of that. Like, why don't you make that your movie? I don't understand. Well, then we wouldn't get this wonderful, you know, denouement between the two of them which, lucky for them, takes place at the old loose dirt pile by the river. <laughs> it's the easiest burial of evidence I've ever seen in my life. They, and two prom dresses just dig into the loose earth. These and girls can't point, even Dot dig a says, fucking hole. That's deep enough. Yeah. Yo, Dot, we needed to go much deeper. Much, <laughs> much deeper. Again, are we sure that this isn't meta commentary on the film? <laughs> oh. That is deep enough. Not intentional. It's not even below the surface. Oh, that's good, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> Maybe this is actually Babbitt screaming for help saying please someone help me i'm imprisoned on this film set these two gays these two gays have done it again oh god no i do think that you're both right there's little moments that actually really work in this film and sometimes Mm -hmm. you know that shot looks great or there is something to be made of the fact that these people are living empty lives and they just can't fucking interior decorate their living room and you know ooh, you can look for some meaning in there and alicia cuthbert is delivering fantastic grody monologues and you're just thinking little sparks but they're so few and far between like this honestly felt like a two-hour film by the time we got to the end of it. I could not believe that it was barely, what, 90 minutes. Yeah. When the credits hit, it is 91 minutes on the dot. It is excruciating. It feels so <laughs> long. <laughs> like being dragged across concrete. It's just, this is the thing that we kind of talk about in Kill by Kill every once in a while, which is I'd much rather see someone go up to the plate and try to hit a home run and either hit one or fail spectacularly. But this is like a failed bunt. It doesn't mean that people aren't doing their jobs appropriately, Mm -hmm. but it all feels like an empty effort that's underwhelming overall, and you just wasted everybody's time for no gain to either side. It's not to say that there aren't technical elements that are interesting or shots that look cool or performances that pop, but... When you put all those elements together, it doesn't hold up for its 91-minute yeah. runtime. And I just wish it had decided to be more interesting in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Gina, any final thoughts on this? You know, there's a lot of different things that could have been done to make this a better movie. And they just didn't do it. And and I think one of you said it was it was a, a you know, kind of a limp dick of a movie. And... and yeah, it's very much a tease, and yeah. you either yeah. you either go all the way with it or don't fucking bother with 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 you know when you're trying to be subversive, you know, indifferent and, and shock the viewer. And I just found myself like, ew, I don't want to hear people talk about their nipples and and how many times a day they jerk <laughs> off. <laughs> it's like you might as well watch the movie Happiness for that if you want like sad people right. talking oh, about yeah. their genitals, yeah. you know. <laughs> So what you're saying is you wanted to see the Todd Solondz version of The Quiet. Hell yes. Hell yes. Make Todd Solondz's The Quiet again. He would have tried harder. He would have made this visceral. I'll do my final line reading of the night, and that is something Joe sent me last night. It seems like a bad idea that no one stopped from filming. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, I think that's a a good summing up of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas my final line reading will be... Michelle, take it down a notch. The whole world already knows you're a cunt. (laughs) Indeed. I'm surprised we only got one cunt out of this entire movie. (laughs) I will say, in that particular scene, Camilla Bell manages to do something I've never seen captured on film or TV or any sort of image-based entertainment. What's that? And that is 
mumble while doing sign language. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the quiet after. That is the quiet. Well, first of all, Patrick and Gina, thank you both so much for coming on to this quote unquote film. We're so sorry again. <laughs> no, no. They made us watch like the second act of Freddy vs. Jason. I think we're even. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's fair. That's that's fair. Yeah. We had this we had this coming. <laughs> we don't give everyone great assignments. <laughs> it's about time someone give us a dose of our own medicine. <laughs> well, on that note, what do y'all have coming up? What would you like to plug? Would you have any big plans for your podcast or personal endeavors that you'd like to talk about? Uh, Gina, what you got in the hopper? Uh, me personally or the show? The show. <laughs> well, <I> mean, <laughs> no one cares about you, Gina. <laughs> Gina, we've established uh, you are the show. So, no, no stop, I mean, stop. I'm talking about your reviews and the written word and the things that you are so great at. I want to give you the floor. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I, I write for The Spool. I review... Uh, TV and movies. Currently, I am recapping Lovecraft Country, as you guys are, which I was in, you know, as we're recording this, we're past the second episode, which a lot happens. A mm, lot yeah. happens in this episode. A little too much, one might say, but evidently, yeah. it, it kind of slows it down a little bit in the next couple episodes. But yeah, uh, you can read my reviews um, at thespool.net, and I am on Twitter under Porcelain72. As far as Kill by Kill Pod is concerned, we have our ongoing Dish by Dish, a Hannibal rewatch project that we do on our off weeks. We're only four or five episodes into it, but uh, people seem to like it, and we certainly enjoy watching Hannibal, mm -hmm. which is one hell of a television show. Agreed. If anyone in this audience hasn't watched it, I, or haven't watched it in a while, I would uh, say go out and do that. It's available on Netflix right now. It's never been easier to catch up on or to rewatch and uh, join us as we talk about it. And of course, uh, our regular Kill by Kill podcasts are going on. We've delved into the Omen franchise. We've talked about the first one on our Patreon, the second one and third one on our main feed. And coming up here in October, just a little while down the road, we are going to uh, venture to Craventown Ooh. and talk about a little movie that has a slight, you know, fandom called Scream. Ooh. Oh, wow. We're going to give Scream the kill-by-kill kill treatment and see how that goes. A film that is practically flawless, with the exception of the character of Randy, a total <laughs> asshole whom people have glommed on to as if he is a, a soothsayer when he is a total dick. I would agree. Are y'all going to do the whole franchise or just the first one? Well, we're going to start with one and let's see how it goes. Okay. Usually the films that we have covered traditionally... They aim high, and they hit maybe slightly outside of the target. <laughs> and that is not an apt description of Scream. It yeah. is a very well-made film, and every frame is really thought about. So I don't think we're going to get as many great teen bedrooms as we saw in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, True. for example. True. <laughs> but you can get a lot of mileage out of Sydney's bedroom, where the door to the closet magically locks her bedroom door. <laughs> yes oh i love that though <laughs> <laughs> well that's great well uh i guess speaking of then if y'all want to get in touch with us you can reach us on twitter and instagram at horror queers and join our facebook horror queers group to hang out with other listeners if you have a moment please rate and review us on your podcatcher of choice we do love a good review uh, i saw a one star review recently that was real fun yay Thanks, jerk <laughs> yay You've made it. If you want HQ merch, check out our store at Tee Public. Just search Horror Queers on teepublic.com. And if you want even more Horror Queers content, please support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horrorqueers. This month we have new episodes on Antebellum, starring Janelle Monet, and Spiral, not from the Book of Saw, but rather <laughs> a new queer horror film hitting Shudder this month. Mm. As well as an audio commentary on Urban Legend to pair with... What, Joe? <gasps> That's right. The time has come. We are dipping into our own franchise. Next week, we're going to be covering not the original Urban Legend, because that's the audio commentary. So we're going to be looking at the sequel, which also just dropped on Shudder. So we're going to be talking Urban Legend's final cut. The better Urban Legend. 
Really? Wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Might have to talk about this off air, Patrick. <laughs> Urban Legends Final Cut is really good mm-hmm. until about 30 minutes in after that bathtub sequence. Then it just like fucking nose dies. I mean, I haven't I haven't watched it in a year, so maybe a year has changed my mind, but oof. <laughs> well, I would say Urban Legend is the opposite of that. Urban Legend is an hour of very pretty people and very pretty photography Mm -hmm. where nothing happens. And then the last half an hour, you get a slideshow of someone's motivation. You're like, well, fuck, that's a movie. Yeah. (laughs) Ding, 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 Patrick. (laughs) I will not argue with you (laughs) because you are not incorrect. (laughs) Like them both as I do, but... hmm. But... Unfortunately, we do have to cut things off tonight. So, on that note, thank you, Patrick and Gina. We can cross out, once and for all, the quiet. Yes, and cross out Horror Queer's milkshake. Disgusting Podcast Network, home of creepy, disturbing, and terrifying creepy pastas, SCP archives, weekly full cast storytelling, horror queers, genre commentary from an LGBTQ perspective, and the Boo Crew. For horror centric interviews, listen free wherever you stream audio and at bloodydisgusting.com slash podcasts. It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are... Things of the past. I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. <laughs> listen to Regarding Dracula wherever you listen to podcasts, or find us online at bloody.fm.